Yeah, what is this stuff on this table? Uh, that's for a different type of setup. We were going to do everything with uh, uh, YouTube, just like the city does mm -hmm. up there. So we bought all of this equipment and then found that that's not the best way to do it. I, I, did, uh, I guess I was wondering if some point we could install this somewhere. We are. I just need to get a place to store oh, I, it. Hey, I get that. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm Okay, everybody that has joined us this morning for this meeting, if you have a camera, please turn it on now and leave your camera on throughout the meeting. Again, anybody that has a camera, please turn it on and leave it on during the meeting. Oh, yes. Okay, are we ready? Um, yes. Okay, we'll call this meeting to order, day 33. Good morning, everybody. Let's see. I can't even tell. I can't read with my glasses that far away. Where we have. Do you want names? Sure. Let's see. Uh, let's see. We have uh, Bert's PC. We have uh, Ron. We have Shan. We have Mark. We have Lee. We have the Sheriff's Office. We have Terry Baker. We have Chris Estel. We have Mike Brown. We have Josh Larrabee. We have Chauncey Molding. We have Scott Klein. Um, we have Pat McAvan. We have Mary Ann. We have Abby D. Klein. We have KMCD News. We have Pammy Jones. We have a phone number of 472-5750. We have a phone number of 319-385. One two two three, and we have a phone number of four seven two three four three six. And again, if you have a camera, please turn it on and leave it on during the meeting. Okay, we have a motion to acknowledge minutes. We have two subs, one's February twenty second, and one's the twenty fourth. We have a motion from Dresch. Second. Can't, can't hear you. 
Motion from Drish, um, second from Hamilton. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, Scott? Yeah, we seem to be getting a really nice break from snow and ice and uh, helping the roads to melt. But uh, again, that creates soft, soft places in the road. So we've been uh, hauling rock all over to uh, bad spots, one inch clean rock, uh, try to take care of those. This morning, things are frozen, but you know, every day we're gonna have freezing and then thawing and for a few days anyway. 10-day uh, forecast, there's some days out there that don't have any freezing weather. So hopefully the roads will dry out. We had just a little bit of rain Friday, but it, it wasn't very much. So um, crews have been uh, blading. They had as the snow was melting, they were blading more and more of it off um, on gravels anyway, it is, is where they were doing some blading. And then um, cleaning and maintaining the equipment, uh, repairing the tire chains, putting on new blades um, for snow plows and uh, for the motor grader blades. And uh, they, they had to do some snow plowing, salt and sand work. Uh, I think we're pretty, sitting pretty well for salt and sand, so. All right. That's um, what the crew's been working on this past week. Okay. Any questions for Scott? No? I don't have any. Okay. Anything else, Scott? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't have anything specific. All righty, we're going to move on. And you'll notice we have a lot of discuss and consider on our agenda today. And a lot of these are probably going to be discussion because we need to discuss some things before we can act on them. So we have a lot of topics that we have been working on uh, and kind of talking around the edges. And so we're just gonna try to get some strategies going potentially. And uh, one thing that came up very recently <clears throat> uh, was um, we had a question. Um, this is the next one on our agenda discuss and consider development agreement between Jefferson County and Bovard Studios. Also adjacent to that, because these will both kind of blend together, is discuss criteria for tax reimbursement for new construction of commercial properties in unincorporated areas of the county. So we had a question come up um, from Bovard Studios because they're thinking about adding an addition and um, Ron or Bert, do you want to um, talk about any of your plans? Yeah, this is something I was thinking about doing about four years ago, and uh, the Ooh. taxes were the big problem because taxes are forever. Uh, and we just need a, uh, would like a, a little bit of a boost to get started on this. Uh, we need to uh, add uh, a frame shop for our business, which is expanding. And uh, it's about a 12,000 square foot building. Uh, our budget and the estimates that we have are about $900,000 to build it. And uh, uh, we would just like some support uh, from, the, from the county for about five years of uh, tax relief to help us get started uh, uh, on this, which will you know, add employment and uh, uh, help us produce product that we've already have uh, have some sales for and uh, uh, a lot of uh, increased potential. Bert, would you like to add something to that? I think that pretty much covers it. The, the uh, history of the business in the last year has been a little bit rocky, but we have maintained full employment and uh, our business is, uh, our sales have uh, 
expanded quite a bit, in, especially in the last quarter. And so uh, we're looking for a uh, surge of new business uh, this year, and we just don't have the uh, production capacity to, uh, to build everything that we've sold currently. Okay. We're also considering purchasing from a lot of local suppliers and vendors and local construction companies to fabricate this. So uh, this should keep a lot of money uh, within the county, uh, the construction of this building. Uh, we'd like to have the building up and running by June. So we'd like to move fairly fast on this if possible. Uh, and this will help us to consolidate our decision on this if we're able to obtain uh, uh, some tax relief for a few years until we're up and running uh, with our production. Okay, um, so this came up Wednesday at a conversation with Ron, and because the deadline for our agendas is Thursday at noon, I said, if you want to put this on, we can talk about it and see. And you mentioned your estimated taxes of this new addition would be what? About $900,000 is the estimates that we have from the suppliers. That's, that's for construction. That's not for the taxes after it's constructed. Yeah, that's just for the construction cost of the building. But the taxes, if my memory serves me correctly, were going to be about $10,000? Uh, that's what it was. That's what the, uh, they told me it was four years ago when I was planning to put this building up. And because of the taxes, I didn't do it. Uh, because ta taxes are forever. It was about $10,000 a year is what the assessor's office told me it would cost for a 10,000 square foot building. Uh, this building is 2,000 square feet larger because now we have uh, more need. So uh, we didn't build it four years ago. Uh, the taxes were the big objection. Uh, so basically we built a building, we purchased a, a building in Mexico where we do some production. Okay, so it'd probably be helpful to know um, what amount we're, we're working with. In addition, I just want to remind everybody that the, of that $10,000, approximately probably 2500 is what we're talking about because that's all the county can address. Understood. And, and so it's not the whole 10000 As I explained it to Ron, if he, he would have to go to the school, the hospital, um, the county trust or the trustees in the townships, um, Indian Hills, all the entities extension on the um, taxes that we all pay. So and if 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 you are if you are wanting tax abatement just on the county portion, the taxes is what we would be able to control. All of the rest of it has to be done by those other entities. Normally with the tax abatements that I've worked with in the past, uh, you get a percentage of what the total cost of construction would be as far as being able to abate the tax on that. And usually that's only for about a three year time period. So at this point in time, it's really, we're not talking about a huge amount of tax dollars that are gonna be saved. If the assessor has told you that the total taxes on the property are going to be in the ten thousand dollar range on an annual basis then you're going to have to look at whether the other entities want to have a uh, hand in abating those kind of taxes right and so that brings us um after i talked to ron i talked to um our assistant county attorney and economic development because i know um i said to Pat, what did we do when Heartland came? Because that was before my, just before my time. And so uh, we don't do abatements as a county. That's a whole process. And so that is the reason for the discussed criteria for tax reimbursement for new construction of commercial properties in the unincorporated areas. And as I started researching this, it became clear we need a strategy and we don't have one. And so if we start doing this for one company, which we're really thankful that they're here and they want to expand, but before we are, can do this, we really need to get an overall strategy. And when this um, agreement with Heartland, it was called a development agreement between Jefferson County and Heartland Co-op. Um, Allers and Coney in Des Moines 
um, was involved in this because it does involve a whole um, methodical approach. So what we as a board need to figure out is do we want to um, have some conversations? Because um, personally, to me, it sounds like, yeah, it's a win-win for everybody, but we need to do it in a strategic way. Um, and, and make it clear we're talking commercial property only. So we need to put something together. Um, and I know Pat, you're on, and, and Josh Larrabee, you, you work, I know with the city a lot on things like this. If either of you have any comments, um, I'd be open. Pat, this is Josh, do you wanna go first? Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'll go first, uh, Josh. Um, I sent an email to uh, you, um, D, and I copied Chauncey in on it that uh, includes the full agreement that was done with Heartland uh, when when they came. Um, as I recall from that procedure, we were actually the board was actually considering a a TIF district, um, and in the process of Putting that together, uh, this other arrangement came came to be, and it actually is an agreement where um, uh, the parties agreed to take the difference in the property tax between January one of uh, so, for example, in this situation for January one of 2020 and January one of 20. Or excuse me, January 1 of 2021 and, and January 1 of 2022, there would be a difference because of the building that would take place. Um, and then it was determined how much that uh, difference was. And then the county actually agreed to um, rebate that amount of that full amount of money, but the county had to do it over a period of years because, as you indicated, uh, we only had authority to rebate the county portion of those taxes. So it took three, three and a half years approximately to, to, to rebate that. Um, that was done with the intention of um, sort of uh, uh, incentivizing a new um, uh, developer and employer to the, to the county. There was some discussion with the board at the time about, you know, hey, how might this apply? Uh, to existing businesses or what do you have for them? Um, you know, that answer, that question never really got answered at that time. Um, in order to do any type of uh, uh, incentive, you have to meet the uh, criteria of chapter 15A of the code as relates to economic development. Um, I think that uh, that's a pretty broad area, um, but there are some uh, criteria involved there. I shared that with you as well, Dee. And then the last thing I commented on was um, that we do have County Ordinance 9-10, which is a partial property tax exemption for an industrial property. I don't know that Bovard would qualify as an industrial property, probably not, but I'm not, I didn't research that in my quick putting this all together. Um, and it's, it's also a provision that's been on the books that we have never utilized, at least to my understanding. So it's, um, those are the, the options I was able to find in sort of the short notice that uh, you gave to me. Josh may have some other ideas or thoughts because this is more his arena than mine, but um, that's what I located, like I said, in that, uh, in that uh, you know, 24 hours period uh, between when you and I spoke and when I was able to get you something. Okay. Josh? Yeah, this is an absolutely good project. I mean, if they're talking about adding to the tax base and creating jobs, um, you know, obviously that's, that's a very positive thing for the community and it's exciting to hear that, you know, industry is doing well um, and, you know, has a positive outlook for 2021 and forward. Um, so, you know, development agreements um, and TIFs, you know, are one way to go. Uh, I would say they're very administratively heavy and they, do cost um, both the developer and the county a little bit more money with legal fees that can't be avoided. Uh, you need to partner uh, with uh, likely your Allers and Cooney who will help our local county attorneys and board of supervisors um, oversee it. So that is a very clean way to do it. Um, the other option is just to look at the county 
um, exploring the possibility of a, a property tax abatement policy um, for commercial development. And um, I, the city has both of these tools in place. If you adopted a policy, um, if that was something the county was able and interested to do, it would be a shorter form and um, it wouldn't commit either party to anything except for what they perform. So in other words, a development agreement would be uh, company ABC is going to add 10,000 square feet and 20 jobs within this time period and the city or the county would um, uh, rebate um, their portion or a portion of that back to the developer, the, the company. Uh, a property tax abatement policy would just be a one page form that says anybody who um, adds to the commercial tax base um, <clears throat> would be able to get exemption or I'm not, not exemption, abatement for X amount of uh, years and a portion of that new increment um, back to the developer. So there's kind of a short form and a long form. Um, both are good practices. So I think that's what the county could explore if they were looking into this further um, is those two options and what would be a better fit for the county. Josh? Yep. Do you, do you have um, any uh, sample or example policies or forms uh, like those that you can share with both uh, the board and myself? Absolutely. Yep. Yep. It's a, yep. Absolutely. I can get that to you today. And so, as you can see, um, there's a lot more to this in terms of we need to establish a process which we currently do not have. So in light of that, I would like to, to just really be supportive and know we're open to it, but we really can't take any action right now until we come up with a, a strategic way to approach this um, would be my recommendation. And I'm, I'm open, Darren, Susie, thoughts? I do too. Speak up. I agree with you. <laughs> I, Steve, I, could I add something uh, for uh, Ron and Bert just to have um, in their pocket if the county was to move forward with either of these avenues, meaning kind of a, the traditional developers agreement um, and a rebate example, or just say a property tax abatement policy, um, either, either avenue of the county board of supervisors were to move in those, that direction. Um, I, I'm not obviously an attorney, but my understanding is that if the project got started and let's say was fully constructed within this calendar year, um, let's say the supervisors got something in place before the end of the year, I believe that they that could still qualify even though the project was done. Again, I'm not an attorney, but uh, based on a, a similar um, example that I was involved with, um, I believe that's the case. So I know Bert and Ron would probably like to have something in place before they get started. Uh, I'm not sure of how fast this could move for the supervisors, but I just wanted to share that, that I believe you can um, retroactively uh, within the same calendar year um, be part of any sort of policy uh, that would be adopted at a later time in the same year. That would be very helpful because uh, we again, do need to move forward. Yeah. Yep. Again, just that disclaimer, um, obviously not an attorney uh, and something I can work with uh, Pat on to explore. That would be helpful. Thank you, um, both Pat and Josh. Any other comments from the board? D? Yes. This late. Uh, we did something that was before my time, but we did something similar with uh, Cambridge. And Pat may remember how that process worked, but they they, I don't know if the rebate's the right word, but they did have some tax incentive for Cambridge when they built yeah. that first building. And that's where I think it's time that we really look at this with a strategic approach so that we have a plan in place that obviously over time will adapt and, and, and that, but we need a starting um, approach. So uh, Josh, I'll be following up with you so we can um, maybe get, some more information on that. Um, and and D, I, I remember what Lee is talking about as well, but I don't remember the specifics of that. So if um, 
you know, uh, I know Abby's on if the auditor's office has any details about the kind of how we dealt with Cambridge or or uh, if the board has any documentation, you know, that may be some uh, something that you want to look at as well. Yeah. You know, indeed, I think an important part of this consideration, too, is, you know, job creation, um, you know, putting up a commercial any let's just say any commercial building in the county. Um, a question the supervisors should ask themselves is that something you would like to provide abatement for or a rebate or would you like to see you know a new building plus jobs created um, that can be something within your policy or your developers agreement too so just some questions to consider uh, going forward as you consider things and you and I talked a little bit about that on Friday in terms of um, yeah we would need to come up with criteria and again that would be part of the research that we need uh, to get a process in place, um, you know, is there a certain threshold uh, dollar amount, how many jobs, what kind of paying jobs, all of that. Um, so, yeah. Okay, any other comments? So, we're not going to take any action today. Um, we're open, but we clearly need to do some more work before we can make a decision on this. <coughs> Darren's got something he wants to say. No, I didn't want something. I was just double checking and I had this feeling somebody was coming on and they are. Yeah. Very good. So. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, thank you for your consideration. We appreciate it. Really? Yeah, we'll, we'll do our homework, okay? All right, understood. Darren, thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, bye. Okay, Terry Baker, update from visitfairfieldiowa.com. Thank you, Dee, um, and thanks for this opportunity to um, come forward. We just wanted to update the supervisors on the activities of the tourism office um, in this rather interesting lack of tourism year that we just um, completed. And um, I always think of March 1st as kind of the start of our tourism season when things start to thaw out a little bit. So we have been spending the last year going, someday tourism is going to restart and we want to be ready for it. So we've been revamping things in our office and looking at new ways we can serve the community and serve the whole tourism um, industry here. And one of the things that we really noticed is that tourism is a very resilient industry. Um, we see a lot of confidence coming back into the marketplace with tourism, although I don't think we will see tourism resume to its levels, um, its 2019 levels, into possibly late 2022 and 2023. So we're looking at a long range of time for recovering. Um, and when I say that the tourism impact, uh, tourism industry has been impacted, I'm really talking about a lot of our small businesses, our attractions, um, our restaurants, our shops, those businesses that serve that tourism industry. So in the last year, what we've done is focused a lot on how, what we can do to help those businesses maintain themselves through the, the last year, um, conducting a lot of different events, doing some, some focus marketing and that sort of thing so that we can really um, shore up that industry and make sure that we have as many of those businesses can survive into the next upcoming, hopefully, surge of tourism and travel. The other thing that we looked at is that uh, tourism is one of those things that we think about, oh, you know, you have to be a place that has a big water park or all these kind of things. And, and we're not really on that level. We have a lot of great things here, but we're really known for, for an interesting and different place that's a little bit more of an escape, a getaway kind of, um, but you don't want to, we don't want to be attracting people who come here and expect some really big city nightlife and all kinds of things like that. Uh, so we want to be careful in our messaging that we are approaching the right kind of people that want to, that will find value in traveling to Fairfield. But the other piece of the puzzle that we're looking at is that Tourism is the first date for economic development and for residents, individuals to move to a new location. And in the last year, we're seeing a lot of people wanting to leave the bigger cities and move to smaller communities. So we're doing a lot of marketing in that aspect too, on that front to just position Fairfield as not only a cool place to visit, but an interesting and great place to live. And so we've been working a lot with FIDA on that messaging and just trying to be sure that 
we're putting something out that is appealing to that, that basis as well. Some of the things that we've done over the last year, uh, you may be aware of some of those projects. I think my, my favorite so far has been our, uh, the big takeout where we uh, provided support for our local restaurants and encouraged the local community to come out and get take out every meal that they could. And we've also done some virtual shopping events, which have actually helped our shops maintain themselves over the last year um, and have reached customers from as far away as Pennsylvania, Minnesota, and California. Um, we had some other projects in place. I know I, I sent you guys a list, so hopefully, um, Dee, you were able to pass that along. Um, we've also been doing some things that we're, we're creating a lot of outreach to um, metropolitan areas such as Chicago, St. Louis, uh, Madison, Min um, Minneapolis, Omaha, and Kansas City. Um, just from the basis that we have these larger metropolitan areas where people are just looking for a, a interesting place, a place to get away from things. And we're positioning ourselves as to be that destination. Once people start traveling, there's going to be a lot of competition around. Um, do we go, you know, what town do we go to? So we just want to be sure that we're on that list on people's bucket list. Um, and I think um, a new project that we have coming up that I'm really excited about is our community blog program. Uh, we are going to be asking uh, local community members to write content for our website, write blog posts, and um, we'll be repurposing all that content to create a really authentic message about what it's like to live and work and play in Fairfield. Our board has just, um, is, we're actually in the process of doing some strategic planning and um, I also sent the supervisors just a brief summary of what that entails. Um, we are still, once that's finished, I'll be happy to forward that complete document to the supervisors if you like. Um, my favorite strategy here is obviously the destination promotion. Uh, that is where we feel we are in the marketplace. We are positioned properly to create that messaging about what happens in Fairfield and create that attractiveness of the community, not only for tourism, but for attracting talent, investment, and business. So with that, I just wanted to have that opportunity to give you that brief summary. I'm happy to entertain any questions you might have. Do you have any questions? Questions? No, nope, I don't have any questions. Thank you, Terry, for the uh, update. Yeah, I, I did also heard, you know, the big takeout was a real success. But, so good job on that, and thanks. Great, right, thank you. Thanks, Terry. Thanks. Okay, discuss and consider the process to collect a nuisance clean up fees. And Pat sent us all a memo on the 15th. <clears throat> and I just thought I'd put this on here again. We may just discuss, we may consider, depends how the conversation goes, but um, Basically, our ordinance does not discuss how the request for repayment is made. Um, he also suggesting talking to the treasurer about what um, like the city does in some like similar situations, like whether it's a sidewalk assessment or something like that. So Mark mm -hmm. sent us all some input on that with some ideas. So, any thoughts from the board's perspective? No, the only, the, only, uh, the only comment I have to make on it is, is that, yes, I like the idea of being able to disperse the payments to the property owner over a period of time back to the county rather than trying to get it all at one lump sum. We aren't prohibiting them from doing that, but, um, I think in some of these cases, it's a little tough for those people to come up with that large sum of money all in one lump sum. So we do need to have something in place for that. But we also need to know what the process is for sending that lump sum bill to that property owner at the beginning of all of this. Because we clean up a property and we have yet to send out a bill to the two property owners that we have already cleaned up, stating to them what their portion is and what they'll be expected to pay. And I would like to be able to start there as our first place to begin with this process. Uh, because you can't, 
you can't charge someone for something if you haven't billed them for it to begin with. So I'm not sure who was actually doing that or was going to do that uh, with a, within the structure of having Russ as our, our nuisance representative and inspector and also um, whether that's the responsibility of us as the board to create that bill and send it out or how that process would actually work. So um, that's a question I, I guess I still have with Pat as far as what we need to do uh, when we do this because again, some of this stuff concerning this nuisance ordinance, since it is fairly new, um, we haven't looked at, at how we were going to do this. And I think it's, it's beyond time that this should have been talked about. Well, the, uh, the ordinance talks about the uh, county sending the, uh, sending the bill or the invoice to the property owner for the cleanup cost. Uh, I, I don't see that as being a Russ uh, responsibility or a contractor responsibility um, because they're not, the payments aren't coming through them. No. Uh, they're not managing the payments. Um, and my, my issue has been, and as we've talked back and forth, it's hard to send somebody an invoice that doesn't explain to them how the payments are supposed to be made. Correct. So um, we haven't made a decision about how the payments are supposed to be made, so it's hard to send them an invoice. Okay. Um, I know that I've, I've spoken to one of those property owners, and essentially what I told that person is that, because um, they were concerned that it was going to show up on a tax bill all at one time. And I said, uh, I've been essentially told them that, you know, nothing is going to show up anywhere for you uh, until um, uh, you receive some, some notification from the county uh, as to how much is owed and, and the process for getting that paid. So, um, you know, that's, that's kind of where we're stuck, I think, um, or where the county is stuck is you have to make some decisions about how you're going to get it paid and the mechanism for making the payment as, as Mark and I spoke, um, you know, the payments, his question was, where do the payments come? Probably his office, right? Probably the right. office. Um, and, uh, you know, is there an account set up to collect? Is it going to come through the taxes? Is so, um, uh, uh, oh, it's been early in February. You asked me for some, uh, you know, mechanisms for collection. So I put that together. I've shared it with you, shared it with Mark. He commented on, you know, how the process may or may not work in terms of the actual collections. And, you know, we're, we're at a point where the board has to make some decisions about, about what they want to do and, and what the invoice that they send out is going to look like. Yeah, and that's why I put it on the agenda. So I've got both pieces here, what Mark responded to us and what you sent us. So Mark had given us like three options, but the one he recommended was a third one. Do a special assessment over a period of up to 10 years for the cost of cleanup and interest, which would be determined by the board is paid annually as part of the property tax mm -hmm. process. So that seems like the most reasonable one. In this latest case, we've got what? A $27,000 bill, approximately. That would be the one that's yet to be done by uh, letting the contract out to the contractor. We've, we've already said that we're going to use a particular contractor and we know what that total is gonna be. We just don't uh, have a way of, of uh, following after it's over with. Um, I would rather address the, the two that we currently have out there that have been done first so that we have this set of rules for the third one. Uh, the third cleanup probably won't be able to happen until after the uh, thaw is all done and conditions aren't quite as muddy as what they would be. Um, so so they'll okay they'll still have that time. Let's use the first one then. So it was about 14,000, right? Right. Round numbers. So if we divide that by 10 years, that's 1,400 per year, which is gonna probably be a struggle for most people, but yet we need to recoup the money. Mm -hmm. So I'm leaning towards this 10 year process. Um, Susie's not in her head. Comment, Susie? 
I agree with Dave on that issue. So, and that's that's where I would fall as well as is spreading it out over a, a ten year time period with a uh, set amount of interest that's also charged on top of that to be able to do that. But that is like any other assessment. If for some reason they happen to come in money, um, they could pay off that assessment early so that they could avoid some of those interest payments uh, coming through as well. But um, I do believe that we have to have this in place in order to keep moving forward with what we're doing with our nuisance property cleanups. Hey, Darren. Yeah. Have you guys looked into the assessed value of the properties you're talking about? No, that's another thing that we have to take into consideration here too, because if, if you spread out, and again, I'll use the number of what they're actually going to be paying back, which is uh, about $12,300 on one property. And if that is spread out over 10 years, that would be $1,200 a year plus interest on top of it. Uh, if that exceeds what the property value is right now, that's going to be another situation where we're going to fall into problems, I believe. So that's something we'd have to talk about more, Mark, on, on how that would work because, um, you know, that's that $1,200 is spread out over two payments, right, a year, $600 each time taxes are due. And Special then, assessments due in September every year. Oh, they're due in September every year. Yep, so it's just a one-time one yep. payment. Okay, so that's something I hadn't understood either. I know normable property taxes are spread out over two payments during a year's time. Right. So uh, that was what I was equating it to and why I said what I did. But um, there's there needs to be some look at that as well because if the assessment is double what the property tax is normally on a property, that could be some complications as well. So uh, there's, there's quite a bit of discussion that needs to happen with this. And I do like the uh, email that you put out, Mark, and I do like the fact that the option that you had was uh, for that 10 year time period with an interest that goes on to it, um, similar to what you would do for a road assessment in front of a residential property. Um, so I think that's a good starting point. So it sounds like our to-do list for the immediate is to find out the assessed value on the properties that have been cleaned up. Right. Would you be willing to do that? I would be willing to do that. Thank yes. you. And if we could maybe have that by next week, we could keep this going sure. conversation. Yep. Does that sound good? Absolutely. Uh, I don't think we need a motion to do no. that, do we? No. Uh, that's why a lot of these are discussed and consider in case everything clicks, we can consider it, but we need more information. Um, but at least we're making some progress. Any other comments um, that we should take into account on this topic? Okay. Um, discuss and consider continuation of rest contract for nuisance ser services. And again, we've got some time before we would need to give a notice, but I put this on because it kind of begs the question of if we choose not to continue the nuisance process in some fashion, <clears throat> whether, whether it's with Russ or somebody else, um, where does that leave the properties that we have already cleaned up? So I know Pat, you and I talked about this. Um, could you please review that with all of us? Yeah, uh, I mean, obviously, um, the the board uh, a couple of years ago was sort of in a position where you were deciding, you felt like the nuisance ordinance was sort of hit and miss at best, and you made the decision, hey, we either have to enforce this thing, and or we have to, you know, consider um, not having a nuisance ordinance. I mean, nuisances can be enforced uh, privately by uh, private citizens through the civil process. So there's, it's not a requirement that there be some sort of a nuisance ordinance or process that the government is involved in. Um, and at that time, the board said, hey, let's, let's, you know, put the, 
the resources behind uh, properly enforcing this. Now we're to the point where we've seen uh, as a board what the costs are with that, what the, uh, um, what the process is. Uh, you're talking about you know, long-term uh, recoupment of uh, some of those funds. And um, you know, I think it's fair to reevaluate uh, where you're at uh, throughout the process. Um, and you know, the, the Rust contract has come up a few times. Uh, you have a 60 day window before the end of the fiscal year with which to provide notice if you don't intend to continue that. So uh, there's not any requirement that it be decided right now or uh, at any time, but it's just, it's just something to be decided. Really the bigger, uh, and it's not really a legal question so much as a political question for the board is, uh, you know, what about the folks that have already gone through the process? I mean, there have been a number of them there have been more folks that have gone through the process in the two or three years since we signed this contract than I have dealt with uh, maybe in the entirety of my career prior to that. So uh, to say that it was um, not effective or that it was uh, targeted at a, a certain folks, um, I, I think that you could, I, I don't think that that's a fair statement. Um, but I will say if I were one of the people that, uh, you know, has this giant bill that we're just talking about because the county decided to clean my property up first, I would, I would be concerned about that. I, I would feel like it was, uh, it, I was being treated differently than some other folks. And so, um, you know, legally, if you decide we don't want to have this contract, uh, you can bid the contract, you can ask for, um, you know, different bidders. You can try to renegotiate with Russ or get an, at a uh, sort of an accounting of, of how the contract is working. Uh, you can, you know, uh, it's the board that enforces the nuisance ordinance as it's currently written, um, either through themselves or through a designee. So you have some options there. You can also go back and, you know, have that same conversation that the board two or three years ago had about whether uh, it's, it's worth um, you know, a full, full speed ahead uh, enforcement option uh, now that uh, it's more clear what the costs are uh, associated with that. So you have a lot of options. Uh, if you decide not to go forward in some way or another, um, I, I don't, I would not recommend a full repeal of the ordinance. I would probably rewrite it in some way. Um, so that it allows for the collection of costs that have already been spent, unless the board decides that that's not something that they want to pursue. Um, but uh, you know, you you have a lot of options because this is this is not the state uh, saying you have to do this. You know, when you talk about all these mandates, this is clearly something that is fully within your discretion. Yeah, that's that's helpful to know that we could rewrite. The existing ordinance um, that seems like the best middle ground solution because I'll tell you after really sharpening our pencils on the budget um, it's becoming clear that we really need to look at nuisance over time if that is a cost the county can afford. Nobody wants a junky house next to their property however there is another option to clean it up that doesn't lie on the county. And um, I know we become clear about that. If we don't have the ordinance, then it's up to the civil process. So this is clearly something as a board, I think we wouldn't like input <clears throat> on, um, but it comes with a cost. And we're working on seeing if we can uh, utilize those costs most efficiently, and that's kind of where we are. Um, so any thoughts? I think, I think we've been given a lot to think about right now. And I think we do need to do, do, do diligence and think about that. So what are our next steps on this? Well, I would say our next step is first to figure out whether we want to continue in, in the contract with Russ. Uh, I know that if uh, we discontinue it the beginning of July, um, we would have to at least contract with them for services uh, that they've already begun and working through the court process with 
uh, a few of the property owners that we aren't actually looking at spending money to clean up their properties at this point in time. But again, there's an aspect to uh, if you do away with that and then you do away with the ordinance itself as it is right now, um, what do you do with the, the people that you would follow through with the process on that you can't continue the process with that you're in the middle of? Uh, I know there's still court appearances that are going to need to be made for a couple of these, and I know that there's already been court appearances made for a few of these, but there are some things that still need to be finished up in both cases that uh, Russ currently has all the information for that, and we would want them to continue to be able to do that, and I have no idea what their hourly rate would be if they were to continue each one of those at this point in time, and that's a discussion we'll need to have with them as well. So um, this is something that I think we began a discussion of how we were going to move forward with the process after the beginning of July, but we don't seem to be going in that direction now. So uh, we, we need to figure out what our alternative is going to be. And as far as, as doing away with it and re-letting it to someone else, we still have to have that uh, connection with Russ, like I said, on the ones that they had begun the process with and started working with. So uh, there's, there's quite a little bit involved with what they do uh, when they go out and the documentation that needs to be taken care of. And uh, the idea of Russ was that it gets the board away from being the responsible party for going out and doing all the picture taking, documentation, letter writing, following up through with the process as far as the property owner's concern, making sure that they've made process, progress if they have said that that's what they're going to do and that the process isn't, or the progress isn't just moving one pile from one location off to another location uh, without actually um, taking anything off of the property. So, and we've run into those situations as well. And it, it, uh, it depends on how much legwork that we wanna have done by county personnel versus doing it through uh, the private entity that we've hired in order to take care of it. Well, it sounds like the next step is let's contact Bruce and have him at our meeting so we can ask him all those questions. I, I will do that. I do. So I you'll be there? Yeah. Thank you. Do you guys know, by the way? He uh, this I'm, Bruce, Pat, I'm actually Pat on the phone. Speaking, Pat is speaking. What? Uh, I think, by the way, I think D, Bruce this is on the phone, by the way. But um, Pat has the floor. I have one. Um, I only have one case that's currently active in court, um, uh, which, uh, which is fine. Uh, I've got a handful of cases where uh, Russ, uh, much like uh, everyone else, is kind of waiting for uh, a break in the weather. The the thaw and uh, things to go uh, evaluate uh, some properties where people are claiming that they've uh, accomplished the goals. Um, the other thing that I will say um, uh, just about this process generally is while I have had more nuisance cases that I have personally been dealing with over since this contract has been in place, uh, what I cannot comment on is how many cases have been uh, noticed and those folks have cleaned up or dealt with the problem without having to get to me in the court process. Um, mm -hmm. right. you know, I think that um, the impact, um, uh, I can't measure the impact um, in that way, but uh, there's more impact than just what comes through me and through court. Um, and so um, there's, a, there's a lot of information uh, out there to be had for you to consider. So, like I said, I think Bruce is on the line as well. It looks like that. So, oh, is he? Okay, Bruce, are you on? I am. Oh, thank you, Bruce. Oh, good. So, can you speak to any of these questions? Sure. I just want to start off by, I don't know. I, I've been on the line for the last few weeks on these discussions, and and I'm kind kind of disappointed. Um, in January, Darren said in our Russ meeting and voted on a pay raise to the employees after I, you know, put budgets together, not knowing that this contract was potentially going to go away. So obviously I factor that into my, you know, budget process and then come to find out 
uh, after, you know, through the grapevine and they had to have the uh, board chair reach out to Darren that this is likely uh, the case that the contract was going to go away. So I'm, I'm kind of disappointed in that fact. Um, and also, you know, I've had many discussions with the previous board and also Darren in the last four or five months on what the process would be to collect. And it would have to be approved because it's in the ordinance that it's considered approved by the Board of Supervisors and then the county sends out a, an invoice to collect those payments. So I, I guess to say that there was not a process or there, we didn't know what the process was, it's been in the ordinance from the inception of the ordinance. So I, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, disappointed in that. I'm also disappointed in what has been said in the last few weeks, I guess, about what's paid or what's um, charged for the contract. The contract price is fifty thousand five hundred dollars. Right. And everything's is, included. Is what, Russ, yeah. It's not. It's not fifty three thousand. Right. It's it's no. everything included. Um, as far as an hourly rate going forward. I don't know. I don't know if the board would want to, uh, you know, I'd have to take that to them and see if uh, they would want to put something like that together. But, you know, I'm, I'm kind of on the fence here as far as we just need to know whether or not we're moving forward or not moving forward. And that's kind of what I've been waiting on the last, you know, few weeks. Yeah, what would really help me is to really know um, how many cases that we've had since we contracted with you and I know Pat can speak to the ones that he's seen in the court but I do know there's been a fair number and there were a fair number before we even contracted with Russ um, and again some of them do get cleaned up which is a positive when we don't hear enough about those but we're struggling with the ones that have been long time challenges so um that i think within the I, and i could get you that information but i think within the first month or two of us signing the contract i think we sent out 39 notices for cleanup uh not knowing exactly which you know how many but we do have that information we keep we keep it all the ones that we've cleaned up plus mm -hmm. the ones that that we're working on plus the ones that's been turned over to pat okay um can you talk a little more about the ordinance you referred to that as far as the process the sending out the invoice yeah so provision provision uh, i believe it's f it says if, if the person is notified to abate the nuisance neglect or fails to abate as directed the county may perform the required actions to abate that's what we go out and do through the approval from you guys approving the uh you know the cleanup cost or the the bid that comes in keeping an accurate account of the expenses incurred. And again, that's what we do. We've sent that information. I've sent it all to Abby. The, supervi the Board of Supervisors shall approve the expenses for the abatement action. The Board of Supervisors shall mail a statement of the total expenses incurred to the property owner who has failed to abate the nuisance. And if the amount shown by the statement has not been paid within 30 days, Jefferson County shall collect it in the same manner as general property taxes. And I, I've, I've said that many times and I've had, you know, four or five uh, conversations with Darren over the last few months on, you know, the, the, it, the county has to send out that, that invoice. Okay, let's see. Um, yeah, I think through our discussion today, we're, we're figuring that out. So the next step for that is to find out the assessed value of those properties and then we consider and vote on if we want to do this option for a special assessment over a period of up to 10 years. Pat, would that mean we'd need to update that ordinance then to put that piece in there? No, because okay. the ordinance allows for collection. Uh, it'll be assessed as a special assessment. So mm -hmm. um, okay. I, uh, that's what that option was contemplated when the ordinance was written. Okay, very good. So that kind of sounds like the information we need to maybe move forward on this. Is there anything else? Hey, D, it's Chris. Can I say something? Yes, please. Okay. Hey, everybody. It's Chris Estel from Public Health, for those that don't know who I am. Um, I just want to say that oftentimes we don't think of a nuisance situation as a health, a potential health hazard, and that can definitely be the case um, if a house or uh, a residence is infested with 
um, rodents or you know standing water all those kinds of things that can spread disease and uh, and uh, if we have a house next to that type of residence that's not going to make any of us happy and um, I think we need to understand the implications of, of uh, maybe not moving forward with that and uh, how it can be a detriment to, to health not only property values but to our to our health as well so um, I just want to say that on the on behalf of public health so thank you okay. Okay. Um, D, D yes. just, like, just for your guys' information, and, and Susie may not be aware of this, but when the new computer came in, I had, um, I guess I think it was PCS, but anyway, they transferred all the files off of my computer to hers, and there is a file folder on that computer. Uh, it's not totally complete, but there is a file folder on there that has a lot of the nuisance properties and the pictures and stuff. Lee, okay. Lee, this is Susie. I do know that, and I have already looked at it. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I'll have a look at that and bring us the total thing. All right, good. Good to know. All right. Hey, um, thanks, everybody, for your input on that. Um, Pat, Bruce, thank you. So we'll get the information on the assessment on the properties that we would need to send bills to and we'll take some steps on that. Discuss and consider budget. So what this is, is more informational. Um, we were struggling to really try to stay within this 2%. And this goes with the next line item, discuss use of COVID funds received by the county for the state. So last week, Finally, the money that ISAC had said that we should be getting came through, it's $136,000. So I did some research on that, on how um, we can spend it. The good news is the supervisors, this is one thing we can actually determine how it's spent. That it doesn't have a gazillion strings attached to it. The criteria is that it has to be used for some COVID related expense. So I talked to Jamie Cashman from ISAC about this. He said, I said, what are, what are counties doing with this? Well, it's all over the board. Um, some are using it and saving it just to see what are, how are revenues going to be affected. So um, there's no timeline, which is the other question that I wanted to find out. Is this something we have to spend by the end of the fiscal year? And no, we do not. So then I talked to Shannon in the auditor's office and she's going to put a special um, line item for project costs for related to COVID in our budget so we can track this. Because Jamie just said we need to be able to track it at some point if the state comes in and says, hey, how'd you spend that money? So that's kind of where we are. Um, and so going with the budget, that helped us come up with the we were going to struggle with finding $27,000 um, to be able to stay within the 2%. So this will help our fund balance to be able to do that. And so next week is our hearing on the maximum allowable levy, which has been published widely. Um, it's also posted out here if anybody wants to look at it again. So that's what the hearing is about next week. And then after that, a hearing will be set on the final budget. Um, which at this point should be lower than that. So I just wanted to give an update on that, and that's where we are. Any comments from the board on that? Nope. No. Uh, okay. Committee reports. I have nothing to report. Um, yeah. I have nothing to report. I thought you had a couple on Thursday. Uh, yeah, nothing, nothing tangible. Nothing. Yeah. yeah. Um, I sat in on a mobile crisis committee meeting the other day, which was interesting. Um, and I was asked to attend that. It's, it was the CDSs that, that were on that because they were talking with the people that contract to provide that service. It's a new service mandated by the state. And so, as I had given somebody the mobile crisis number to use, and they didn't have a very positive experience with it. I passed that on to the governance board, and that, and so this, um, because it's a new contract, um, it's being looked at to see are we getting what we're paying for, 
And so um, I was very impressed with the CDSs on the call. They did a good job in really holding the contractor accountable, which tells me as a member of the governance board, um, they're doing a good job to be shepherds of the money and stewards of the money. So that was quite encouraging. The challenge is there needs to be some work on that service and I think that will be happening. There was an Area 15 meeting, nothing uh, major there, um, some routine things, but uh, that was kind of what I had. Okay, any public comments? Public? Alrighty. Hearing none, uh, do we have a motion to allow claims and re approve reports? So moved. Second. <laughs> Motion and Hamilton second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, any more on nuisance properties? Not at this time. Okay, thank you, everybody. Need those meetings.